Uh, what is brown tie? It's a, a sorry, mic. Pat, just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. A little, that's good right there. Right. A microscopic allergy. Um, very, very small. And ultimately, when it, it blooms, as they call it, when it starts to reproduce, uh, what's called the cell counts, the numbers, the sheer numbers start to increase, where it actually turns the water column uh, like a coffee brown, almost a rust color. And really, that more or less extends from the surface right down to the bottom. How does it, why is it so bad for shellfish and fish? Well, once it gets established, it's, it's fairly short-lived. You know, we see these blooms last roughly a month. Um, just like any plant, um, when it really starts to die off and decompose, rot, it will consume the dissolved oxygen out of the water. So there, there has to be a certain level of oxygen for fish and shellfish to survive and other uh, marine life. So when those, that oxygen level starts to really be suppressed, then marine life is stressed. So fish have to really probably, you know, they're going to be stressed to survive or have to try to move out of the area and get in into the outlying areas where brown tide is not present. How bad is it? How much has it impact the uh, marine life in, in this area? Brown tide really started appearing in, uh, I believe, 1985 in the Peconics, and it had subsequent years. And it, it literally wiped out um, probably hundreds, if not thousands, of acres of eelgrass beds, which is important bottom habitat. These are plants that grow off the bottom. You know, they're important nursery grounds, uh, important habitat for bay scallop, for instance. And because, uh, you know, brown tide in turning the water rust colored, uh, the, you know, you don't have the sunlight getting down to the bottom, so the plants can't survive because they need, you know, they need sunlight for survival. So they start to die off. That loss of habitat then affects everything. Where is, what, let me put it this way, what is causing brown tide? Well, the, the science now as it emerges, uh, really it, it's linked to higher nitrogen levels, a nutrient. And this is really the, the, the majority of that nitrogen is coming from on-site uh, wastewater systems, um, residential cesspools in layperson's terms. So the tens of thousands of homes that you know, are built in this area, uh, basically with backyard cesspools that leach uh, the wastewater down into the groundwater, and that groundwater eventually moves toward our creeks and open bays. And the, the travel time of groundwater is very slow on the order of a couple feet a day. So, you know, it could take 10, 20, 30 years for that groundwater to actually get to uh, the water's edge. But as it's enriched, again, with uh, high nitrogen levels from um, septic systems, you know, now we're, we're basically introducing that nitrogen into, the, into this water column. Uh, and at very low levels of nitrogen in, in marine waters, now all of a sudden triggers these algal blooms. What do you do about that? Uh, tens of thousands. It, it of is complex. Work. I'm, you know, I've been certainly advocating uh, and trying to address and, and put spotlight on uh, wastewater for a number of years now, and you know, we're having that conversation finally. Um, for many years, Suffolk County, the, the health department, has managed wastewater for drinking water protection. Uh, so to ensure that, you know, again, our wells are safe to drink. But there's a, a big difference between safe drinking water, you know, relative to nitrogen levels, uh, as opposed to what's uh, healthy or for the ecology of our bay. Is this problem going to get worse before it gets better? I think so. Yes. Um, you know, we might just be seeing the development from the you know 60s and 70s. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more development. So, you know, the conversation really has to start addressing. Okay. How do we deal with our wastewater? You know, there are advanced technologies uh, that can be, you know, uh, fitted to basically backyard septic systems that effectively denitrify. Uh, they are costly, though, so we, we have to figure out, you know, how are we going to pay for this? Um, you know, I, I think over the long term, and this is, a, you know, probably a four-letter word, but, you know, we're going to have to start looking at some kind of uh, uh, taxing mechanism. You know, in the Chesapeake Bay, which is dealing with this, they have what's called a toilet tax. So, you know, the residential properties throughout their watersheds, you know, they're required to basically, um, you know, provide 
uh, funding source to start to deal with this, you know, on a, on a more wide scale basis as opposed to, you know, one home at a time. And, you know, obviously that's a, you know, the costs are going to be a big burden for, um, you know, the residents. But, you know, we, we cannot continue the status quo. You know, we have a very primitive uh, way of dealing with our wastewater. Um, you know, basically hydraulic out the pipe, you know, as long as the pipe's slanted downhill into the backyard leaching pit. And it's caught up to us now. And I, I don't think the prospect of wide scale sewering is, is really going to be a reality here. So I think we, we've got to probably address it on a more, um, you know, uh, individual property basis or in like neighborhoods what's called uh, you know clustering or decentralized wastewater treatment but I, I think you know, you know without um, hesitation you know all new development should really require state-of-the-art treatment and um, you know I, I get frustrated because you know the county's been slow in, in really getting on board with these um, advanced treatment systems and, you know, I think, you know, I, I see the developments being approved all over the place. And, you know, it's the status quo. And we've got to start somewhere. So new development, state of the art. And then let's figure out how to develop that funding mechanism to build, uh, deal with the built infrastructure.